Okay, hello guys. I'm Andreas. And I'm chair of this session. And now we have the second lecture on Michael Hay about mechanical quantum systems. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, okay, so I'm going to do my second lecture here. And just to recap, last time um, I told you about um, a variety of applications and fundamental pursuits, at the center of which are mechanical devices that are being developed in, you know, in or near limits where quantum mechanics uh, expect to be important in describing the dynamics. And I tried to give you a sense of the variety, both of the applications and of the types of devices that, that people are developing. And so, for instance, the applications we saw ranged from uh, gravitational wave detection to uh, magnetic imaging and the size scale of the devices ranged over many orders of magnitude from kilometer and sort of kilogram scale uh, mechanical systems down to things like you know even single layers of, of, of graphene, so an atogram and, and nanometer scale uh, systems. So today what I'd like to do um, is start talking about some of the experimental challenges we face in trying to explore uh, quantum mechanics with these otherwise classical systems. These are systems that we normally observe uh, their emotional properties uh, to behave, behave classically. And what I'll do in this um, is try to give you a sense of the state of the art in regards to meeting a lot of these, uh, ex these experimental challenges that I talked about, okay? All right, so I'm gonna start with this question. You uh, should, should be able to see it there. What does it take uh, to see, to observe quantum behavior in, some, uh, in the motion of some macroscopic object. And so I've just put a couple of pictures here to just remind you of what I mean by a macroscopic object. I'm talking about uh, some system whose motion we usually describe using Newton's laws, essentially. And that could be an engineered structure at the nano or micro scale like this, or some you know, block of material that's truly macroscopic that you can hold with your hands and see uh, with your eyes. And it just incidentally, this isn't uh, you know, a crystal at the heart of some state-of-the-art uh, quantum measurement scheme. It's just a, uh, a sample that I like from my daughter's rock collection. It's a business crystal. She's, she's particularly fond of it. <laughs> okay, so as you can imagine, the answer uh, to this question here is an extensive subject. It depends a lot, you know, there are a lot of subtleties related uh, to the nature of different quantum states of motion, to the nature of how these systems interact with their environment and how these systems interact with different kind of measurement schemes, okay? And in this talk, I'm just going to focus on, on two simple aspects of, of these, these uh, challenges or these issues here. If you're interested in, in learning more, um, a great place to start is this book that I mentioned uh, last time in the last lecture, Quantum Measurement by uh, Vladimir Roginsky and Fareed Khalili. And in this book, they, they literally start the book by saying, okay, I have some macroscopic object, I want to measure its motion as precisely as possible. At what point, under what conditions do quantum mechanics, does quantum mechanics come into play? At what point do I uh, see quantum mechanical effects? And how does quantum mechanics actually ultimately limit my resolution in tracking the, the motion of the, these objects? Okay, so it's a really nice book. So they go from that very simple, sort of broad question, and then go on to tackle a lot of subtle issues related to different uh, specific <coughs> measurement schemes. Okay, so in this lecture, as I said, I'm just going to focus on two basic aspects of this question, and those two essentially boil down to uh, reducing the effects of thermal noise in our systems and developing quantum limited displacement detection. And I'll try to quantify what I mean by that later on. But what I'd like to do is start discussing the, the role or the eliminating the effects of, of thermal noise. <coughs> okay. So a cantilever like this, we said last time that it's vibrational modes, we can model them as simple harmonic oscillators, just masses on a spring. If they're quantum mechanical, we expect they have this nice spectrum here, the ladder states, and so on. But clearly, just looking at this SEM image here, there's more going on than just a mass on a spring, right? First of all, this cantilever, it has finite extent, it's not a point particle. So it can have defects and impurities throughout its volume. It can have defects and impurities on the surface. Moreover, it's been carved out of the substrate. So when this thing flexes as it's moving, 
There's a shear force on the, on the substrate there that launches elastic waves into the substrate. It's also metallized, so as it's, it's oscillating, it can radiate electromagnetic waves. It can also pick up charge and be susceptible to spurious electromagnetic signals coming in. Okay? So in a nutshell, this isn't a, a mass on a spring in isolation. It's you know, a simple harmonic oscillator embedded in some kind of environment where you have all these different sources of fluctuations uh, that kick and damp the resonator and cause it to hang up at, at some temperature T or some characteristic of some thermal bath. Okay? So here I'm assuming that all the noise sources, all the fluctuations that can perturb this mechanical resonator are, are thermal in nature and they're going to neglect any kind of non-thermal uh, noise sources here. Okay, so we know at you know, high temperatures for KT much, much greater than H bar omega, we expect a cantilever mode to have some kind of average energy KT, right? And it's going to have fluctuations on the order of KT. And these fluctuations are going to serve to wash out sort of the discreteness, the subtlety of these features that we want to actually see. So if you, you know, if we're, if for instance, we're to prepare a mode in a number state somehow, these thermal fluctuations would cause it to stochastically hop around between different number states over time. If you were to prepare some kind of superposition of number states, these thermal fluctuations would cause a decoherence of that superposition. You can ask a simple question, you know, how, to what, at what temperature do you have, do thermal fluctuations start to become negligible uh, with respect to the phenomena that we want to see, okay? And another way of saying it is how important are thermal fluctuations in limiting the obs observation of quantum mechanical effects? And it's really different levels of sophistication for addressing this question. So sort of the, the most basic crude level or the most basic rule of thumb that you could develop as to at what point, at what temperature thermal fluctuations become negligible, you can arrive at by just requiring these thermal fluctuations to be small compared to the energy spacing of the harmonic oscillator's ladder states, right? So we're requiring KT or H bar omega to be less than one. We say at that point the mode is frozen out and these thermal fluctuations start to become negligible with respect to the effects that we want to see. But of course, this is a very basic, crude rule of thumb, and it's also rather stringent. And it, it's essentially, you know, implicitly assuming that the, your measurement that you're making of the mechanical device, whether you're measuring its motion or its energy, it's occurring on a long time scale compared to the relaxation time of the mechanical device, the time at which, the characteristic time over which the mechanical mode exchanges energy with its environment. And so here, this tau measure is just some t time associated with how quickly you're acquiring information about the displacement of, of the mechanical device. And this gamma here is a damping rate uh, for the mode, okay? So it's characterizing how quickly the mode uh, exchanges energy with its surroundings. And this gamma, as I was alluding to in the beginning of the slide, this gamma could be made up of many different uh, contributions from all different kinds of phenomena that might perturb it. Okay, so in this really basic crude rule of thumb, we're assuming that we're measuring very, very slowly compared to the time scale at which the mechanical mode exchanges energy with its environment. But it doesn't have to, you, we aren't limited to that, that situation. Okay, and if we move away from that limit, we can actually arrive at less stringent uh, rules of thumb. And let me walk through an example here. So, just to give you an idea, let's look at some typical damping rates for the, these systems. And I think everybody knows the damping rate of one of these modes is usually defined as a frequency of oscillation divided by the quality factor of the mechanical device. So basically the number of oscillations before it damps. For these kind of mechanical systems in our field, the Qs range from something like 100 up to a million, depending upon the system. You can, uh, I'm not going to go into the details about which devices have which cues, but you can look in these reviews up here. Um, it, it, oh, okay, I guess we can't move that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. I think I will, these will be posted online, so you will be able to get that reference later on. But you can definitely see this bottom reference here, which is actually the most recent one and has the most information about quality factor for these devices. Okay, but the main point I want to get across is that quality factors range from about 100 to a million, depending upon the device and the conditions. At the same time, I mentioned last time that the frequencies of our, these devices range from the kilohertz regime up to, to gigahertz. So you can calculate expected 
damping rates, expected uh, relaxation rates for these systems. And usually gamma would be less than or approximately 10 megahertz. Okay, so that would correspond to a relaxation time greater than about 100 nanoseconds. And it's important, this number is important because we actually have measurement devices that in principle could, or actually do allow people to measure the motion of these systems on a time scale that's, that's quicker than that. Okay? So we, we, don't, we aren't necessarily limited to this condition of measuring very slowly compared with how the energy is exchanged with the environment. We can actually measure uh, quickly on that time scale. And in this limit, you can arrive at a much less stringent requirement for which temperature you need to get in order for thermal fluctuation to start to become negligible. Okay, so let's assume we're in this limit where we can measure much more quickly than the mode is exchanging energy. So to arrive at this sort of new rule of thumb, you just consider, first of all, in the long time limit, the mode is going to have some energy KVT, right? If that's what it's going to relax to over a long time. It, it's going to relax that exponentially, usually, right? So, but at short times, that exponential is just going to have a linear time dependence in the damping rate and the amount of time that you're waiting, the amount of time that it has to exchange energy. Okay? So the total energy exchange in some measurement time that's short with the characteristic damping time is just given by this quantity here. And it, if we require that that be less than h bar omega, we arrive at this new rule of thumb. Okay, to see that this actually is less stringent than the bit more crude uh, rule of thumb over here, I'm just going to rewrite these equations. I'll just put t on the left-hand side of both. Okay, and what we see comparing these two equations here, we see that indeed the temperature at which you get into this limit where thermal fluctuations start to become negligible is boosted by the quality factor divided by the measurement time <coughs> in comparison with this more basic rule down here. Okay, so it tells us that the higher the Q, the mechanical system, for, or the lower, the quicker you measure, the larger temperature you can get away with. Uh, and, still, and have thermal fluctuations be really, um, not dominant. Okay? Of course, what I've gone through here is just really sort of hand wavy at this point, very general. If you're interested in looking at more specific uh, uh, concrete examples, calculating you know, at what point thermal fluctuations become negligible, you can look in these books up here by Berginsky and the references therein. One of the books is Quantum Measurement, which I just referred to before. And then there's also this other book, Measurement of Weak Forces. And he works through some nice examples. Okay, what I want to do though uh, is look at what temperatures in practice we actually have to get to to cool these mechanical devices down. Um, I'm going to just focus on, oops, I'm just going to focus on this most more basic rule of thumb uh, because it's, it's simpler to address in a more general manner. manner. I don't have to uh, make any assumptions about the measurement of time or, or uh, the damping of the devices. So on this plot here, on the y-axis, I've plotted our rule of thumb. I've relabeled it as a thermal occupation number. It's just the high temperature limit of the Bose-Einstein occupation factor. This is the this rule of thumb is plotted as a dashed line here. The uh, Bose-Einstein occupation factor is a solid line in this plot. I've plotted this versus temperature, uh, some bath temperature that the mechanical mode is it's coupled to, um, and it's for several different frequencies that are typical of nano and micro scale mechanical modes. So. You know, ranging from hundreds of kilohertz up to gigahertz is what I included here. Okay, below this red line here, the, we say the mechanical mode's frozen out, right? Thermal fluctuations, KT, start to become small with respect to H bar omega. And what's it's probably obvious to you is if you go to lower and lower frequency mechanical mode, you have to go to lower and lower frequency, or lower and lower temperature of your environment before you get into this, this freeze out regime, right? That makes sense. So if you have a 10 megahertz device, you have to cool your environment down to less than a millical in order to, to meet this, get into this regime here. If you have a gigahertz device, it's much less restrict, restrictive. You only have to cool the, the environment down to 50 millical or so. Okay. What's important is that this range of temperatures here, from millical temperatures on up, it's accessible using standard cryogenic techniques. So in principle, you could take one of these mechanical devices and put it on something like a dilution refrigerator and cool it down into this regime where you can start to expect uh, these thermal fluctuations to become small with respect to H-bar. Okay? 
So, um, I guess I'll get into some history here. So, when I, when I was in graduate school, when I started graduate school in, in 2000, no groups had yet actually demonstrated the cooling of a mechanical mode down in, in this regime here. And I was fortunate enough at the time uh, to get involved with the research group for my PhD project in a Keith Schwab's group at the University of Maryland. Uh, and my, the project that I was, got involved with was actually trying to develop a uh, displacement detection scheme and a mechanical system that we could operate in this limit. And so, you know, we spent about five or six years on this, and in the end, we didn't quite get into this regime, but we got very close. And so let me just talk uh, a little bit about, about that effort. Okay, so this shows one of the devices my colleagues and I developed in Maryland. This uh, the mechanical device that we were interested in is this uh, doubly clamped, high aspect ratio uh, nano beam here. It's about 200 nanometers or 300 nanometers wide. I forgot now, I think it's uh, close to 10 microns long. The mode we were interested in was the fundamental in-plane flexural mode, where you have an anti-node at the center here. And that mode frequency was about 22 megahertz. And what we did was we integrated this with what's called a superconducting single electron transistor. And toward the end of the talk, I'll say a little bit more about how, how this works and its noise properties and stuff. But in a nutshell, right now, the way this works is a displacement detector. We were using this uh, transistor to monitor the motion of the mechanics. And the way that works is you run current through the transistor here. And when the mechanical device flexes back and forth in the plane, that changes the conduction, which modulates the current, and then you can read that out using various techniques. All right? So you can read out the modulations in the current to detect the motion of the mechanical mode. Okay? So what we did is we put this device on a dilution refrigerator, shown here. Uh, we put it at the coldest point, which had a base temperature of around 25 millicalum. And we cooled this system down, um, you know, starting from room temperature, cooled it down to 25 millicalum. And while we were cooling it down, we used the, the single electron transistor to measure the Brownian motion of this mechanical mode. So we basically measured the thermal fluctuations of its position about equilibrium here, again, using this, this transistor. And in this plot on the left here, I, I want you to ignore the colored lines here and just focus on the, bl the black dots. All right? So this plot is mechanical mode temperature in temperature units and in thermal occupation number. Uh, plotted versus bath temperature. So basically the temperature of the, the phonons, the, the temperature is measured by our, our thermometry on, on the refrigerator. So as we cooled the temperature of the refrigerator down, we found that the mechanical mode temperature decreased proportionately. Ultimately, once we got to the base temperature of the, of the fridge, uh, we found that the mechanical mode also reached that base temperature. This corresponds to a thermal occupation number of about 25. Okay. That was the best we could do with, with this refrigeration scheme, this sort of passive refrigeration where you're cooling the environment. And um, you know, if we could have gone, uh, gotten colder and cooled down to one millicalvin, we should have eventually seen this hang up at the, you know, close to the zero point level for, for the mechanical device. But we didn't get there. We got to a factor of 25 from that. At the time, though, this was actually the closest demonstration uh, anybody had put forth for cooling some kind of structure uh, down, a structural mode down near the quantum regime. Okay. And actually, this result stood until about uh, 2010, when this really uh, important result was put forth. So this result was from Andrew Cleveland's group at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He's actually at the University of Chicago now, but at the time he was at US UCSB. And his group developed this micro-mechanical device, which they also, also wanted to cool down, uh, try to cool down into the quantum regime. And so, the mechanical mode that they were actually interested in on this device, it wasn't one of the flexural modes. I mean, this looks like a cantilever, and it is, but they weren't interested in the low frequency uh, flexural modes of the device. They were actually interested in a high frequency dilatational or breathing mode, where the structure is expanding and contracting uh, at a frequency of about six gigahertz. Okay? So they were interested in that mode, and so they measured, they were able to measure that uh, mode's motion. They put this device on a dilution refrigerator similar to ours. Um, and I should back up for a second and just say for a 6 gigahertz resonator, you'd expect the crossover to this freeze-out regime uh, to be about a 300 millicalvin. So they put this 6 gigahertz device on a refrigerator, cooled it down to 25 millicalvin, and indeed were able to demonstrate that the thermal occupation number was less than 1. Okay, so they demonstrated that they could get out into, could get into this, this freeze-out limit. Okay. So this was a, a milestone for the, the field. And uh, you know, it was the first demonstration of taking a structure with some, some kind of classical 
uh, some sort of mode that normally behaves classically, and then putting it in a limit where you would expect to start to see quantum mechanics, or where quantum mechanical effects should be dominant. And uh, what they did after that, after cooling it, uh, was even more impressive, and uh, I'll talk about this in, in lecture three. And in a nutshell, they essentially coupled it to a superconducting qubit and performed a, were able to perform quantum Rabi oscillations and some interference experiments with this mechanical mode. Okay. I'll talk again, I'll talk about that next time. Um, what I want to say before moving on, though, is that this is an, another example of passive cooling of the mode. They took, put it, the mechanical device on a refrigerator, cooled the refrigerator down, and through various thermal couplings have cooled the mechanical mode down. Okay? And the only reason this, this would work for them is the frequency of the device was so high, it was 6 gigahertz. Problem is, most devices that people are working with in our field have much lower frequencies. Frequencies in the megahertz range, tens of megahertz, also even down as low as the kilohertz regime. So for those frequency devices, it's just impractical, impractical with the cryogenic technology that we have to cool into freeze out, to the low thermal occupation of that How can they actually measure this kind of frequency? Yeah, so it's actually they didn't actually measure directly the displacement. It's something that um, what they did was they prepared what they would do is have the qubit and the mechanical device, they assume they're both in the ground state, so they prepare them both in the ground state at this temperature. Then they apply a pi pulse to the qubit to put an excitation, an excitation in it, and then they would um, bring it into resonance with the mechanical device and see if uh, it would absorb the energy. And then the other thing that they would do is not you know, just have the qubit in its ground state, then bring it into resonance with the mechanics and see if that would excite the, the qubit. And they, would, they were able to put some bounds on what the maximum temperature could be based upon the, the you know, finite percent of the qubit uh, excited state population that they could measure. And that bound was like 0.1, basically. So it's a good question, but they didn't actually measure the rounding motion the way we did. They didn't have a displacement to do that. So they used the qubit more as like a spectrum. Uh, spectrum. Okay. So um, most devices in the field are much lower frequencies, so you can't use these cryogenic techniques to cool them down. Um, importantly, though, the field over the last decade has developed um, techniques that for cooling mechanical devices that don't rely on passive ref refrigeration, but instead use the measurement process itself to engineer an effective environment seen by the mechanical mode uh, that cools it down. Okay, and this is known as um, back action cooling. And so I'm going to get into the details of this in a second, but just to give you an overview, I've shown three different uh, devices here, and three different mechanical devices, and each one of these mechanical modes or mechanical structures is integrated with an electromagnetic cavity. So for example, in this image here, we have a drum head resonator, a micro drum head resonator, uh, which serves as one half of a plate of a capacitor, which is in a lumped element LC circuit. Okay, so it's a resonant... Uh, you know, microwave resonance circuit there. You have um, another nanostructure here, and there's some uh, finite element simulations of it here. In this nanostructure, the mechanical mode is a breathing mode that, you know, breathes in and out, expands and contracts, and it's also integrated with uh, an optical cavity. Okay, so it's a photonic cavity there. You can confine light really strongly in that region. And for this example here, you have a high aspect ratio of beam which uh, is, it, again, integrated with some electrode, and so when this mechanical device moves, it changes the capacitance of a, a microwave cavity. And in each of these examples, the microwave, or the electromagnetic cavity that's coupled to the mechanical device, uh, serves two purposes. First, it provides uh, transduction of the mechanical motion into either the microwave or optical regime for measurement of the motion of the device. And the second purpose is that through the measurement process, the electromagnetic cavity does work back on the mechanical mode, damping it, causing it to cool below the environmental temperature. Okay? So that's why it's called back action cooling. So it's through the measurement process, the cavity actually does work, exerts a force, and does work on the, the mechanical device cooling it down. And as you can see here, just I've listed some thermal occupation numbers. A, number, a couple of groups have demonstrated they can use this to get into this freeze-out regime, and many other groups like this one have gotten very close, okay? So you don't need to necessarily cool your environment to, to freeze out. You can use, you can engineer an effective environment with these uh, cavities. 
And so this has actually become a uh, technique of choice for the field. And so what I want to do is spend a little bit of time explaining how it works. Okay, to explain it, I'll just start with a sort of a generic uh, scenario with the optical, optical fabric row cavity and where you have, you know, one of the mirrors in the cavity uh, is, in, you know, free to oscillate, some kind of mechanical oscillator. And also the other mirror in the cavity uh, is partially uh, transmitted so you can send laser light in. Okay. So now, imagine that you, you choose some kind of laser light wavelength lambda, and this lambda is not quite it's, it's too long to meet this uh, constructive interference condition for a resonance in the optical mode. Okay? So your laser light lambda puts you on this part of the optical response curve. Okay? This is just a plot of the optical field versus cavity length. Your lambda and your L put you right here. Okay? When the mechanical device starts oscillating, when it's moving, what that's going to do, it actually modulates the frequency, the resonant frequency of this cavity. Right? So that's going to move this curve back and forth, basically, and so it's going to modulate the amplitude of the field inside the cavity. Okay, so this mirror is moving back and forth, it's changing the resonant condition, your laser input light is fixed at some uh, wavelength, and so your optical field inside the cavity is also modulating with the mechanical motion. Right? And so, because the optical field's amplitude is changing, the number of photons inside the cavity must also be changing. Okay? So that gives rise to a modulation of the radiation pressure inside the cavity. And accordingly, it's also going to give rise to a uh, modulation of the radiation force on the mechanical motor. Right, so the mode is moving, that's changing radiation pressure, which changes the force back on the mechanics from the optical field. And what's important about this is that there's a delay in this back action. There's a delay in the change of the radiation pressure force in response to the mechanical motion. So when this mirror moves, say it goes uh, inward, so it comes this way, as it moves, the optical field doesn't decrease instantaneously and simultaneously track the mechanical displacement. It actually takes time for the field amplitude to decrease, and that's because there's a finite leakage rate of energy out of the cavity. Okay? So when the mechanical device moves, it takes some time for the cavity field amplitude to adjust, and it's got to essentially wait for photons to leak out. Okay? And importantly, this delay can be used for cooling. And let me explain how that works. And I'm just going to oops, I'm just going to clear out this section here. And so this plot here shows the radiation pressure force on the mechanical device versus the displacement of the mechanical device. And the way you can use this radiation pressure for cooling is shown here. So we have our uh, optical response curve. So the radiation pressure force is maximum when the, the length of the, the displacement of the mechanical device allows you to meet the, the resonant condition for the cavity. We're going to imagine that we're, the laser light, the lambda is chosen so you're on this side of the optical resonance. Okay. Now imagine the mechanical device starts moving outward. So it starts lengthening the cavity. So you start going up the curve like this. When that happens, both the radiation pressure, radiation pressure force and the displacement are in the same direction. So the radiation pressure force is pushing outward and the mechanical device is moving outward. All right, so in this part of the cycle, positive work is being done by the, uh, the operator. But now imagine that the mechanical device starts swinging inward. Okay? So it's coming back on this part of the cycle, the upper part here. It's coming in and the cavity is getting shorter. Radiation pressure force is still outward. But now the motion is inward. So the work done in this case is, is negative, right? The, the cavity is damping the mechanical motion. And what's really crucial to understand how this can be used for cooling is to realize that as the mirror is moving back inward, the optical field remains high for some time because of the <coughs> delay in the photons leaking out. Okay? So you actually have a higher radiation pressure force for longer compared with the other cycle, or the mechanical mode, other part of the cycle, the mechanical mode is moving out. Okay? So the radiation pressure forces remain high here during this part of the cycle. So the magnitude of this negative work is actually greater than the work done on the outward pump motion. Okay? So in the end, over one complete cycle of motion, net negative work is done on the mechanical mode. So it's damping it and it's cooling it down. Okay? And in fact, 
Um, there's some nice papers that work through the details of this and show that you can actually use this technique to cool the mechanical device down to it, close to its ground state. And uh, there's a nice PRL by Florian Markhart here. Also, the review Modern Physics with Marcus Aspenware is one of the leaders in the field of optomechanical systems. Uh, he discusses this in depth in there as well. Okay. The point is, you can use these radiation pressure forces to cool the mechanical device down to near its ground state. This is, just to recap, this is referred to as the back action point. So it's, it's really the, the, the phenomenon that you're using is the response of the, the cavity to the changes in uh, position of the mechanical device. So the mechanical device moves, that changes the radiation pressure, which exerts a force that's delayed on the mechanical device and causes it to damp. There's another way of looking at this, though, which might be more intuitive. It's an equivalent picture. It's in the frequency domain. And, and when you think about it, the frequency domain, people call it side damp cooling. Okay? And I've replaced the, uh, uh, you know, the image that I had up here, the fabric row cavity, with two new images. And I just did this because I wanted to emphasize the sort of general discussion that we're having about back action cooling or side band cooling. Uh, it's applicable both to optical cavities and to mechanical elements inside a microwave cavity, like an LC oscillator. Okay? So in the frequency domain, the way to think about this is you have some laser or some microwave signal that you're applying that's negatively detuned from the cavity mode resonance. Okay, so this is again the, the optical or microwave response of your cavity, and now it's versus frequency instead of length of the cavity. You apply a frequency of your laser that's detuned from the cavity negatively, and for simplicity, let's assume that it's detuned by the mechanical frequency, capital omega m. Okay. Now, you send this light in to your cavity or microwaves in, and the motion of the mechanical device, again, is changing the resonant frequency of your electromagnetic cavity, and so that's going to modulate the intracavity light and give you sidebands at plus or minus the mechanical frequency. All right, so inside the cavity here, you're going to have your fundamental tone that you're applying in, and now because of the mechanical motion, you're going to have a sideband at plus omega m and a sideband at minus omega m. And what's important to realize is that because this upper sideband, plus omega m, lands exactly on the cavity mode right at its response, right at this frequency where it has a large response, this sideband is resonantly enhanced compared to the lower sideband. Okay? So this, the amplitude of the light in the microwaves at this frequency is going to be much greater than, than the one at this frequency here. Okay, so you're up converting uh, light to that frequency. All right. And if you stop and think about it for a moment, from the conservation of energy, the power or the energy that's in this sideband at this frequency here must have come from somewhere. And in fact, you can show it comes from the mechanical motion. Okay, so the mechanical motion, energy is being taken out of that to produce sidebands at this at the cavity frequency here. Mechan energy is taken out of the mechanics to upconvert the light. Alright? And so through that process then, you do this continuously starting with a mechanical mode that's at ambient temperatures. This is just the noise power spectrum of your harmonic oscillator in mechanical mode. As you drive at this frequency here, you'll damp and cool the device uh, down. Okay? You're sucking energy out of it. There's a, actually, so this is all in sort of classical, but there's a, a quantum picture of this which is really quite straightforward, it, it, or at least intuitively think about. Uh, it's essentially, it's equivalent to Raman scattering. You send in a photon at your laser frequency, omega L, it scatters off some phonon at omega M to produce an upconverted phonon at, at the cavity frequency. And you can show that there's an effective Hamiltonian that describes this process. Where here the A and the B uh, uh, operators refer to the mechanical and, and uh, cavity mode uh, creation annihilation operators respectively. And you know, there's some coefficients out in front here. This G here is a geometrical coupling strength that basically tells you about the overlap of the mechanical mode with the optical or microwave field. And then the square root n term here, it's, it's given by the drive strength. So how many photons you're sending in to stimulate this sideband process. Okay, so the more photons you send in, the more of these upconversion events you can have, the stronger this, this interaction is. The quicker, the, the quicker rate it happens at. Okay. Let me uh, give you some examples of <coughs> implementing this. So this, um, this figure here, I showed this device a little while ago. Uh, it's from the group of um, John Tufel, uh, Ray Simmons, Conrad Leonard at NIST Boulder, Colorado. 
Uh, and again, as I said earlier, the, what they had was um, a drum head resonator that can move, uh, has a fundamental mode that's like 10 megahertz in and out of plane. And that drum head resonator has another electrode underneath of it, which serves as the other half of a capacitor. So you have a mechanical device changing the capacitance uh, of the, that circuit element there. And then this capacitor is integrated in parallel with, with an inductor, a planar inductor, just a coil. So the, uh, in, the in the LC frequency of this LC circuit is something like 7.5 gigahertz. Okay. So again, here, rather than having a mirror that's moving and changing the resonant condition of your cavity, you have a capacitor that's moving and changing, modulating the LC frequency. Okay. All right. They also have here, um, just shown in the cartoon, there's a transmission line which is coupled to this LC circuit and in the mechanical device. Okay. And they can use this transmission line then to send in light and then probe the response of the cavity. Frequency. Okay. So what they do is they, the light that they'll send in, they choose it to be negatively detuned from the cavity resonance, like I was talking about before. So they, they detune the, this drive signal from the, uh, the LC resonance by the mechanical frequency. That light, or that, those microwaves go in, and then they're upconverted by the mechanical motion to photons at the cavity frequency. Okay. And then they monitor these cavity photons to infer the position of, of the, the, or infer the, the oscillation of the mechanical. Okay, so this plot on the right here shows uh, the cooling process at work. So starting from the top, what they're actually showing this is the noise power of the mechanical motion plotted versus frequency. Okay, and this top trace here is shown for a very small number of incident photons, average photons, 18. Uh, and it's also at you know a, a temperature of about 15 millicalvin. So what they've done is they've actually first cooled this mechanical device down to 15 millicalvin on a dilution refrigerator. And then they start cranking, cranking up the power of the microwave signal that they send in. So the effective number of photons on average being sent into the cavity is increasing here from 18 up to 4,500. Okay, so they're sending in photons. These photons that are being upconverted, taking energy away from the mechanical device, being up converted to the cavity frequency, which is what they're seeing here. And as they cool the mechanical device down, you see that these, this, the noise peak here for the mechanics has been broader and smaller, broader and ultimately it's almost flat here. Okay. And the, the, you know, the peak is getting smaller because you know, as the mechanical mode cools down, you can take out only so many, so many photons you're running out as it gets colder and colder, right? So for in the figure shown here, they cool down to a thermal activation number of about 0.93. Okay, this they actually got down to 0.34, and it's shown on a, the next graph here. Um, you have to put it on a different scale. So this is the, the bottom trace from the previous graph. They turn up the photon incident photon number even higher, and eventually they get down to a minimum of about 0.34. And then after that, as they turn the photon power up, or, you know, the microwave power up. They start having some spurious effects occur, like uh, heating, uh, and also what happens actually these two peaks here that they see. With, what's going on here is that the coupling between the mechanical device and the microwave cavity has become so large that they're no longer independent oscillators. They're two coupled oscillators, and what you're seeing here are the new, the um, hybridized uh, eigenmodes of that coupled, those two coupled oscillators. Okay. okay. So this was a really important result. It's the first demonstration using the sideband cooling technique to cool a mechanical device below the temperature of the environment and get it into freeze out. All right? This was a 10 megahertz motor mechanical device. They would have had to cool this passively down uh, you know, with a refrigerator that could get down to less than a millicalvin in order to reach these kind of occupations. But they were able to do that by just using this up conversion technique. Okay? And before I go on to give another example, I want to explain uh, just, I just want to talk about a nice experiment, follow-up experiment that they did with the system once it was cold. Okay, so in a, a follow-up experiment, they actually demonstrated that they could use the sideband technique that I just talked about, in addition to another sideband technique to actually transfer, store, uh, and then extract a coherent state from the mechanical mode, and they could go on to verify that there was actually entanglement between the mechanical motion and the microwave field. Okay, so. The techniques that they used to do this included the technique that I just talked about, the cooling sideband cooling pulse, where they tune their microwave frequency 
negatively from the LC mode and then detune it by the mechanical frequency. So again, this is sucking phonons out of the mechanical mode. In the, the protocol that I'm going to sh show you in a minute that they use to do this entanglement uh, experiment, they also call this cooling pulse a transfer pulse because you're transferring photon phonons out of the mechanical mode and into the, the microwave regime. They use one other uh, sideband technique for this experiment. And in here, instead of driving on the negatively detuned side of the, of the response, they actually drove at a higher frequency. Okay? And so you can show that when you drive at this higher frequency and are detuned by the mechanical frequency, the incident <coughs> photons that come in, they get down converted to the cavity frequency and at the same time produce a phonon that's correlated with that photon at the, at the cavity frequency. Right? So light from light at your carrier frequency is down converted in producing pairs of entangled phonons and photons. And, and you can actually show that this interaction is described by this Hamiltonian here. Where no longer do you have, you know, annihilation operator, operator creation op operator, you actually have creation creation. So it's telling you you're creating both a phonon and a photon uh, in this process. And they're correlated with each other. Okay? So let's see how this works. <coughs> So again, we have our device, it's the LC oscillator with a mechanical device parametrically coupled to it. You have a circuit description here describing what's going on. You can send microwaves in, uh, either at this red detuned uh, frequency or at this blue detuned frequency. Those microwaves come in through the circulator here, which is just a device that's sort of unidirectional. It routes the microwaves in one direction. So they come in, they get routed into the LC circuit here, they, and then they either get up converted or down converted. And to the cavity frequency, and then those cavity frequency photons are sent out to some sensitive amplification. Okay, so first, what they do in this experiment, they apply a cooling pulse to the mechanical mode to bring it from its ambient temperature, 15 millikelvin, down to its base temperature, down to the freeze out regime. Okay, so they apply this pulse, it's negatively detuned from the resonance, up converts to photons to cavity frequency, takes phonons out. So here, during this pulse, mechanics is cooled to its ground state. And they then shut off this cooling pulse, or transfer pulse, they call it both, and then they turn on their entangling pulse. So the microwave's at this blue detuned frequency. Okay? So at, while this pulse is on, it starts creating correlated photon-phonon pairs. The photons are at the cavity frequency, the phonons are in the mechanical resonance. And so what you see as this entangling pulse remains on is you're creating more and more of these photon-photon pairs, and those photons are leaking out, and they're measuring them with their amplifier here. All right? Again, those photon-photon pairs are entangled with each other. They then shut off this entangled pulse for some time that's variable, some delay time here. All the while, those photons are being stored in the mechanical device. It's some coherent state that they've created in the mechanical device. And then they turn on the entangling pulse again, and they can extract, so this is red detuned light, they can now extract the phonons that were stored and recover the, this microwave signal here. Okay. So, what's important though is that during this pulse technique, the phonons and photons should have been correlated with each other, they should have been entangled. So that means then that the photons that are created in the second cooling or transfer pulse, they should be entangled with the photons that were created uh, in the initial pulse here. Okay. So to, to see that, to look at those correlations, they've repeated this experiment tens of thousands of times and calculated the correlations, and they calculated this uh, EPR and separability parameter to gauge whether or not uh, the photons in this process were correlated with the photons in that process. And they found, indeed, uh, and they calculated this inseparability parameter of about 0.9. And why that's important is that you can show that for separable states, this should be greater than or equal to 1. Okay, so indeed, these, the quadratures, by calculating the variances for these quadratures, they could show that the microwave, two microwave pulses were actually entangled with each other, which implies then that the phonons that were stored during this time in the mechanical device must have been entangled with the microwave field, the initial pulse there. Okay? And the, the, furthermore, what they found is that the entanglement persisted uh, for delay times, times when the, both pulses were off, of up to about 10 microseconds. So it was telling you that decoherence time of the mechanical system was around 10 microseconds. Okay, so this was really a, another milestone for the, for the field. It was the first demonstration of entanglement between the macroscopic 
mechanical mode and another quantum system, in this case the microwave field of the cavity. Um, and also it's important, uh, because the decoherence time is long enough, it's only over 10 microseconds, that you can imagine using this device, integrating it with superconducting quantum bits uh, and having it serve as some sort of uh, quantum memory. Okay, hold states. Okay. So, let me uh, just go really quickly one other example. So, um, that, was, that last example was in the microwave regime. The groups uh, using optical cavities have also employed the sideband cooling technique. Uh, I'll go through this really quickly. This, I showed this device before. This is, um, uh, it's called an optomechanical crystal. It's this nanostructure that has um, these breathing modes, these breathing mechanical modes in them, and they overlap strongly with uh, this photonic mode that's been created by putting these little perforations spaced uh, <coughs> aperiodically through the structure here. Okay, so basically the, you know, the antinodes of this optical cavity here have large overlap with portions of this uh, structure that have large strain for this mechanical mode. Okay. In this example, the mechanical mode frequency is something, it's a lot higher actually, it's in the gigahertz regime, it's three, three and a half gigahertz, and uh, the cavity uh, resonance is about 1550 nanometers. Um, what they can do, it, it, this isn't in the microwave regime so they don't have transmission lines, but they can use a tapered optical fiber to send laser light in uh, to, you know, to uh, stimulate the sideband processes, and they can also use the same optical fiber to recover uh, photons that leak out of the cavity. Okay, and again, just to show you, they're going to use the same sideband cooling process, where they negatively detune their laser from the cavity frequency to upconvert cavity photons and cool the mechanics. Okay, and so that's actually you know, this is the, the crux of their their results here. They start at some ambient temperature. Uh, for the mechanical mode, the thermal occupation of about 80, and they start cranking up the number of photons that they send in, and they find they can cool this down all the way to about 0.85. Okay, okay. let me. I want to skip through some details here, and I just want to say uh, and talk really quickly about an important follow-up follow experiment that this group did. Uh, and I should have said that this was from Oscar Painter's group at Caltech. Okay. Um, they were really leading the development of this, this kind of system. Um, so after demonstrating that they could cool the mechanical mode down into the freeze-out, they actually performed an experiment to measure the asymmetry in the mechanical mode's ability to absorb and emit light, or absorb energy as it cooled down close to its ground state. Right? So if you have a system that's been cooled down near its ground state or to its ground state, it can no longer have energy taken out of it. You can only give energy to it, right? It can't go any lower than the ground state. So they probe this asymmetry in the mechanical mode's ability to emit and absorb energy, okay? And so that's, um, let me show it here. It's this experiment here. The way they did this was initially they drove, they did two separate experiments. They drove their optical cavity on the high frequency side, detuned by the mechanical device, and measured, again, here you're, down converting light at this frequency and creating phonons. So you're giving energy to the mechanical device, and that's reflected in a sideband that you measure at the cavity frequency. So they did this process, measured the sideband amplitude here, which again is reflecting how much energy is being dumped into the mechanical mode. They then repeated the measurement, except drove it with a laser frequency that's negatively detuned by the mechanical mode. And as I said several times now, when you're driving this at this frequency here, you're taking energy out of the mechanical mode, you're up-converting the light to the cavity frequency. And so the sideband, in this case, reflects the energy that's being pulled out of the mechanical motion. Right? So if you were to cool this mechanical device down to its ground state, you would expect this process to go to zero. And so what they show here on the right, that I've got listed here on the right, is these are the sideband amplitudes at the cavity frequency for the, these two processes where the emission into the mechanical device is the red trace and the uh, extraction of energy from the mechanical device is the blue trace. And so at high thermal occupation number for the mechanics, you can't see any difference between these two processes. But then as you start to cool the mechanical device down, so six photons, photons, you can start to see that this red process, the ability to put energy into the mode, is actually uh, happening 
more than the, the other process, taking energy out of the motor. And as you get down to lower phone numbers, that asymmetry becomes enhanced. And what's important is that the actual big, I should have written that there, here, absorption equals emission. In this region, you're starting to see the asymmetry. And you can show that the difference between these two rates, between the emission and the absorption rate, is just given by the zero point contribution. If you just think about uh, absorption and emission in general, you usually have this extra term for the absorption that's proportional to the zero point term. Okay? So this was the first demonstration uh, uh, in the field. Oh, oh yeah. This is the first demonstration in the field. Uh, of a measurement of a difference in motion attributable to zero point fluctuations. Okay, so again, it was another milestone for, for uh, mechanical quantum systems. Okay, at this point, um, this should raise some questions. Namely, you know, what are the limits? So I've just shown you a slide in which, a couple slides in which people have measured the mechanical device down to close to its freeze out or in the freeze out. And I've also said they performed measurements. That where they can distinguish uh, the zero point fluctuations contribution in in the, the motion of their mechanical mode. So it raise, should raise the question: of, you know, what is actually required to measure displacement with the sensitivity to detect these fluctuations? Okay, and that's what I want to spend the remainder of, of the talk talking about. So we're going to talk about engineering quantum limited displacement detection. Okay, so I want to start with a really uh, simple example. Sort of idealized, a, a, a set of idealized simple examples. So let's say we have some, you know, nano object, and we'll assume it's a free mass. We're not, we'll talk, we're not going to talk about harmonic oscillator right now. We'll assume it's some free mass, um, and we want to be able to track its position as precisely as possible. Okay. So then let's say, you know, we'll make this really idealized. And let's say we could, you know, put, imagine putting this into some kind of Heisenberg microscope. Okay. So you have. You know, uh, the lens doesn't show up. You can imagine there's a, there's a lens right here. Uh, you have some image sensor, a CCD screen. Uh, and you, what we're doing, very idealized, we're confining this mass uh, to a plane around the focal point there. And we want to track its position as, as uh, precisely as possible. Okay, well, you know, the way this works, the, using this microscope, you send in photons. Photon will scatter off that object. Where it hits the where the photon then hits the screen up here from the position of where the photon hit, you can infer from usual optics where the mechanical that mechanical object must have been. Okay? And you can just use, just using the focal length and the length of the uh, distance to the image screen there. But of course, you know when you do this, there, we don't know the the position with with absolute uh, certainty. There's always some imprecision, and it's you know. One possible uh, source of that imprecision would be the diffraction of the light through through the lens, right? So there's going to be some uncertainty through the light diffracting here, and that uncertainty is given, you know, by the diffraction limit of the microscope, proportional to the wavelength of light, focal plane, and then divided by the, the diameter of the lens there. I'm going to move this stuff out here and move this up to the top and just clear out space. Now. In principle, we could make this imprecision as small as we wanted to, right? We could just crank up the power, crank up the energy of these, these photons coming in, make lambda smaller and smaller. But obviously, there's in practice, there's some problems with that, right? Some of those problems are technical, right? So increasing lambda, or decreasing lambda, you're increasing the energy. At some point, you damage the object that you're trying to measure. You could also, at some point, once the wavelength gets small enough, you're no longer going to be probing the, the position of the object with respect to this point here, but you actually might start probing the surface structure of the object. Right, those are technical problems. A more fundamental problem, though, is if you wanted to make repeated measurements and track the trajectory of this object over time, then any imprecision in your initial measurement would feed into, through the uncertainty principle, would feed in uncertainty into subsequent measurements, right? As you make delta x smaller and smaller, you make delta p larger and larger. So again, I'm going to clear this up and move, move this upward. Okay. So let's just run through this. So you, so you make an initial measurement with imprecision delta x naught that comes from diffraction. Upon that measurement, 
You're going to have some uncertainty given by the uncertainty principle, the sort of back action, giving you an uncertainty in the knowledge of the momentum that's just h bar over 2 delta x. Okay. Now, let's say you wait some time tau and then make a second measurement. That uncertainty is going to dynamically involve, evolve into an uncertainty in position at this time tau. Right? See, it's an uncertainty momentum that's going to evolve to a later uncertainty in the, in the position. And that's going to be in addition to the imprecision that you'll have in that second measurement there. Okay? So the total uncertainty for the second measurement is just going to be the sum of these two terms. And you can see you have one term that's proportional to the imprecision and the other term that's inversely proportional to it. Right? So if you in, improve, the more you improve your initial imprecision, the more it's going to hurt you later on uh, through this dynamically evolved uh, uncertainty and momentum. Okay, so I'm just going to clear up this again and move this upward. Okay, so the moral of the story here is that making precision, making measurements with arbitrary precision in delta x will render subsequent measurements completely uncertain or more and more uncertain as you make delta x smaller and smaller. And again, this is just because x and p uh, obey this uncertainty principle of relationship here. All right? There's a trade-off between the measurement in precision and the back action through the uncertainty principle. Okay, but what this equation suggests, we have one term that's proportional to the imprecision, another one that's inversely proportional to it. So it suggests that there's some optimum. So you can, map, you can minimize the total uncertainty for the two measurements with respect to this imprecision, and you can ar arrive at an optimum value for that imprecision that's just given by this term here, h bar, square root of h bar tau over 2 mm. Okay, And this is known as the standard quantum limit for a free mass. If you make measurements with imprecision uh, at this value, you will achieve the minimum total uncertainty in a, in, you know, for the multiple measurements, repeated measurements. Okay? <coughs> And it's important to point out that when you make measurements with this, this level of imprecision, you can actually see that these two terms, the imprecision and the uncertainty, uh, balance each other. They contribute equally. Okay, So when you're making measurements at the standard quantum limit, you're really balancing this measurement uncertainty with measurement back action. Measurement imprecision with measurement back action. Okay, let's look at another example really quickly. Uh, instead of a, a free mass, just consider a, a simple harmonic oscillator. So we just have some beam that's free to vibrate and plane about an equilibrium position with some amplitude displacement. It's moving with some displacement amplitude x. We'll assume we have some transducer down here uh, that can measure the motion uh, in, in uh, you know, a Heisenberg type uh, microscope way where you're actually doing strong, quick measurements. Okay. So we're assuming we can do really strong, quick measurements like in a Heisenberg microscope with this transducer here. Now, for this case, for the case of the simple harmonic oscillator, there is also a standard quantum limit. And it also uh, derives from the uncertainty principle and the dynamical relationship between the position and momentum of the harmonic oscillator. And to see this, let's just write, we'll write the usual equations of motion. This is in the Heisenberg uh, picture for the operator x and p. It is a usual equations of motion for a harmonic oscillator. If it was classical, it would trace out a simple circular trajectory in phase space, right? But because it's a uh, quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator, x and p have to obey this commutation relationship <coughs> at any instance in time. Because of that, they have to obey this uncertainty principle relationship at every point in time as well. Okay? And so as a result of that, your trajectory, its trajectory in the space space here is not going to be some point, uh, you know, fine line. It's going to have some um, uncertainty to it. It's going to be smeared out. So, for example, imagine at t equals zero, you make a Heisenberg microscope type measurement of the position of, of the, the oscillator. Okay, and you do that with some imprecision delta x naught. Then over time, through the equations of motion, the dynamics, this imprecision delta x naught, uh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. This imprecision upon the measurement is going to give you that uncertainty through the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So there's some uncertainty in momentum there. 
Now, if you let time evolve, uh, really sorry, I didn't coordinate this too well. So uh, let me back up. So the, you have some initial imprecision delta x naught, so that's going to give you the width of this sort of uncertainty a little here, and then you're going to have through the uncertainty principle uncertainty and, and momentum. So that's going to give you the, the height of that there. So you have this ellipse, uncertainty ellipse about this for this initial measurement. Okay. So I move, just move that stuff up. Now, oops. if you let time evolve, you can see that the uncertainty that you have for another, for the position at some later time is going to evolve according to this, this equation here. And you have one term that's proportional to the initial imprecision, and again, another term that's inversely proportional to it. Right? So the smaller you make the imprecision in the initial measurement, the more uncertainty you're placing in momentum, and so that's going to come back at a later time and feed into uncertainty in the position. All right? So essentially what's happening is this ellipse just swings around in phase space. So that after you know, pi over 2 degrees, all that initial uncertainty in momentum has swung into being uncertainty in, in position. Okay. Of course, you can wait some time until it comes back around to this point, at which you'd be back. You know, if you made a measurement then, your imprecision would be delta x naught plus a new delta x naught from the new measurement. Okay. Okay, but this expression here, uh, again, it, it suggests that there's an optimum because one term is proportional to the imprecision, the other one's inversely proportional, and so you can, you know, minimize this again with respect to delta x naught, and you find that the imprecision that you know minimizes the noise is given just by this term here, which is equivalent to the zero point RMS motion, h bar, the square root of h bar over two m omega. Okay, so if you make measurements the imprecision at this level, you will be measuring with the minimum possible uncertainty uh, the object's position. Okay. All right. So, and actually in this particular case, again, you're going to be balancing the imprecision noise and the back action noise. They'll be contributing equally. So your uncertainty ellipse actually becomes an uncertainty circle about that point. Again, there's this trade-off between the precision and back action. At the standard quantum limit, you're balancing that. You're actually projecting, in this kind of measurement, the harmonic oscillator into a minimum uncertainty wave packet. Okay, so these previous examples um, were you know, highly idealized uh, examples where you have sort of instantaneous, really strong projective measurements. By instantaneous here, I mean that we're assuming that we're making measurements that were quick on the time scale of the dynamics of the relaxation of the mechanical devices. By projective measurements of saying we are really, you know, the measurements were very strong and collapsing uh, our knowledge of the position of the resonator to some very well-defined value. In reality, in general, in our field, the mechanical devices that are being measured are actually weakly coupled uh, uh, to the measurement probes. Okay? And so they're weakly coupled in the sense that they're extracting information about the motion of the mechanical device on a time scale that's slow compared to the dynamics of the, the mechanical device. And in many cases, it, the coupling between the, the probe and the mechanical motion is weak enough that you can consider it to be linear. Okay? So I've shown some examples here of, of linear displacement detection schemes in, in our field. One of them is this SET that I keep referring to. Uh, in this case, the current through the SET is linearly proportional to the motion of the mechanics. That's a form of weak coupling. And the same thing with this atomic point contact here, the current's linearly proportional to the displacement of the mode. In this example, optomechanics, the change in frequency or the phase of the cavity is proportional, is linear with the displacement of the beam. Okay? And it turns out for these linear displacement detectors, there's also a set, there's also a standard quantum limit uh, limiting your, your measurement resolution, setting the minimum possible displacement sensitivity that you can have. And so let's look at that really quickly. Um, so you work on the quantum limits of linear displacement detection, go back uh, to the you know, beginnings of gravitational wave uh, detector developments. There's a, I've listed a seminal paper here by Carl Caves. Um, it's also Brodinsky's book is another nice resource. Osh Plurk is a theorist at McGill. He's one of the leading theorists in the field. 
He's done a lot of really nice work in the last decade formulating the quantum limits of linear displacement detectors uh, and linear detectors in general in a, a nice linear response quantum noise picture. You know, you, if you're interested in that, you can look at this uh, Review of Modern Physics article that he and his colleagues wrote back in, in 2010. I'm not going to talk in today's talk about the details of this linear response approach. I just want to give you the overview of what you know, the quantum limits of uh, linear detection are. Okay, before I get into this, let me, so it's 10.15, should I go an hour and a half? Or, or to, okay, great. Okay, so for any continuous displacement detection, a phase-preserving linear detector must add noise. So there's a lot of words in here I have to explain. So for continu continuous di displacement detection, I'm assuming you have some detector that's monitoring uh, the displacement of your harmonic oscillator, this mass on a spring here. And I'm assuming that by continuous, you're making repeated measurements that are much quicker than the dynamics of, of this oscillator. Okay, so that's what I mean by continuous measurement. By phase preserving, I mean that you know, if you have your equation of motion for the position of your oscillator, by phase preserving, I mean that you're amplifying these quadratures of the motion equally. Okay, so in some sense, you're learning about both the position and the momentum of the momentum over time, and really sort of tracking its trajectory in <coughs> phase space. And of course, by linear det detector, I mean there's some, uh, the, the output of your detector is essentially linear, linearly proportional to the motion of the, the object at the end. So for any detector that obeys these, it must add noise and it, it's constrained by this amplifier uncertainty principle limit. Okay? So the noise product of these two terms here must be greater than or equal to h bar squared over 4. And this has been shown, you can learn about where this comes from by looking at these, these references here. But let me explain what these terms are. So the SF here, it's the spectral density of the noise uh, force acting back on the mechanical device. Okay, so there's some fluctuations in the input degrees of freedom of your detector that kick uh, the mechanical device around. Okay, that's what SF is representing. And so that leads to real fluctuations in the position of the mechanical mode. Alright, so you can imagine you have some force uh, spectral density here. This is your oscillator response function. So it's like your oscillator is essentially filtering the force fluctuations from, from the detector here. Filtering this noise from the detector, you know, causing the mechanical device to, to move around. All right, so this is the back action from the detector on the mechanical mode. Also, there's another contribution to be additive noise from the detector. So this is just noise that's not acting back; it's just corrupting the signal. Okay. So the product of these two noise terms for a linear de detector, phase preserving detector, linear detector must be greater than or equal to h bar squared over over four. Okay. Alright, total noise at the output of your detector would be given by this, the sum of these two terms here, SF and SX. Now, I'm going to say that the equality here is the defining criterion of a quantum limit de detector. Given a, a detector that has noise properties can meet the equality here, we call that quantum limit de detector. Most detectors that you can think of don't satisfy this quality. I'll give you two examples in a couple slides. And I want to say one other thing. There's actually, you know, the, the reason that they don't, most detectors don't meet this is partially because they don't have the noise properties. But then another factor actually comes into this, into determining the relationship between the force spectral density and the, the imprecision spectral density. And that's the coupling strength between the mechanical device and the detector itself. If you actually have this relationship where the force spectral noise increases with coupling. So as you turn the coupling up between the detector and the mechanical motion, these force fluctuations increase more and more, which makes sense. You're just kicking it harder as you couple the system strongly, more strongly together. At the same time, though, by increasing the coupling strength, you boost the mechanical displacement signal above the additive noise of the detector. So you improve this, this term here. Okay. So satisfying this equality here it depends on the, the noise properties of the detector and on the coupling strength that you can achieve in your with your mechanical device. Right? And just highlight this 
So this plot here shows the total noise at the output of your detector displacement noise. You have a contribution for measurement and precision, which decreases as you increase the coupling strength, so it comes down. You also have a contribution for back action, which increases as you increase the coupling. And what you can see here actually is because of this sort of inverse dependence, one is proportional to lambda, the other one's inversely proportional to lambda, there is an optimum. And at this optimum, if the noise properties of your detector are right, you can approach the quantum limit. You can meet this equality here. Okay? And when that happens, I'm sorry, I should have written that there. When that happens, the total noise added by your detector in the measurement process is equal to a zero points worth uh, of displacement. Okay, so the at total noise at this optimum, where you've balanced the imprecision and the back action, the best you can do is add another zero point uh, motions worth displacement to your signal. Okay? So this is the standard quantum limit for linear displacement. Okay, and I should say, so I haven't said anything about the intrinsic noise of the mechanical device. That also is going to have uncertainty either due to thermal fluctuations or the quantum fluctuations, right? So let's, if you assume your mechanical device is at t equals zero, it's going to have, uh, and it's in equilibrium with environment t equals zero, it's going to have th uh, zero point fluctuations, so its own uncertainty. And then the detector on top of that is going to add back action and it's going to add the imprecision. So the total noise that you would have is uh, twice the zero point uncertainty squared, at least in terms of noise power. Okay? So that's the best you could do. That's the best um, sensitivity you can have in measurement in, for this weak linear displacement detection. All right. So uh, as I said before, there's most detectors are not capable of meeting uh, this criteria of getting to the quantum limit for displacement detection or even for other kinds of detection. I've just given some examples here. I'm not going to run through the numbers, but you know, an, an op amp that you could find in the lab that you can buy for 50 cents, you can calculate what its noise product is. Here, the, the back action noise would be given by current noise, additive noise is voltage. You can calculate that it should have a noise product of something like 10 to the 18 h bar squared. So you're really far away from being quantum limited. Even a cryogenic amplifier like this uh, hemp amplifier, which you can buy commercially or buy, buy from private groups, uh, it has a noise product, back action times in precision, of something like uh, 10 to the 4 h bar squared. Okay? Uh, so even if this costs $5,000 and that costs uh, you know, 50 cents or whatever, so from that improvement you go from 10 to the 18 down to 10 to the 4, but you're still not, you know, you're still pretty far from, from quantum limited. Okay. But there are some detectors that, that get close or are expected to get close to the quantum limit. I'm just going to spend the last couple of minutes talking about those. So the first one is the single electron transistor, or specifically the superconducting single electron transistor, which I've mentioned a number of times in the last two lectures. And so uh, just you know, to give you an idea of how this works, we have a couple uh, traces of aluminum here, these thin traces about 100 nanometers wide. There's, they overlap. This trace overlaps with this, this trace here, and this one overlaps with that one there. At those points, you have tunnel junctions. Okay? So there's an oxide barrier, actually, between the aluminum traces. Um, nearby the, the transistor, we usually have some kind of electrode, uh, which in this case is actually suspended. It's our nanomechanical device. But there's some capacitive coupling between that, that nano resonator and this little island here of aluminum. Okay? And What's important about the single electron transistor is that the current that flows, you know, if you voltage bias this, voltage bias these, these leads here, the current that flows through the transistor is very sensitive to any charge that's on this electrode here, or anywhere else for that matter. And so what you can do is you can apply a voltage to this the nano resonator, the metal on here, it's metalized, you can apply a voltage to it and change the charge that's on here, and you can modulate uh, in a very dramatic way, the current that, that flows through the transistor. Okay, so you can see here, you get a, a measurably large change in current for a small change of charge, a fraction of an electron charge. So this is one electron change in polarization charge on, on this electrode. And you can see you've changed the, the current dramatically there. To op use this as a displacement detector, what you can do is actually op you know, put your transistor at an operating point, like right here, or here, or here, 
where the response of the current to changes in charge is, is basically linear, right? Like the current varies linearly with, with charge in those regions, at least for small changes in charge, okay? So then what you can do at these bias points, uh, you set up, you know, you set up the VG, so you're at one of those, and then when this mechanical mode starts moving back and forth, that's going to modulate the charge to this capacitance and it'll modulate the current. So you can use this, detect this transistor as a linear displacement detector. Okay, now, the noise of this detector is ultimately limited by the correlations in the charges that tunnel through the junctions here uh, that make up the current that goes through the device. Okay? And so for certain transport resonances that you can have, which I'm not going to talk about, you can have alternating tunneling events of a Cooper pair tunneling on and then a quasi-particle tunneling off, and a Cooper pair tunneling on and a quasi-particle tunneling off. There's this resonant process called the Josephson quasi-particle process. There's actually another process called the double Josephson quasi-particle process. You have a Cooper pair tunnel on, uh, two quasi-particles tunnel off, and then another Cooper pair tunnels on. Anyways, in those kind of processes where you have these highly correlated tunneling events, uh, the noise of the detector is, is then limited by the correlation between in the, in the tunneling. And that will actually set both your imprecision and your, um, and your back action noise. And the way this works, so the additive noise, the imprecision, is just basically the uncertainty in the, the current that you measure, the current that's flowing through here and you measure here. There's some uncertainty in when these tunneling events occur, so that gives rise to the fluctuations in current. Okay. The back action noise also relate to the uncertainty and the tunneling of the, the charges here. But what actually happens is, every time either a Cooper pair or quasi-particle tunnels, that changes the potential, the voltage on the island here, which then changes the force on the nano resonator, which gives it a kick, okay? So charge tunnels on, that changes the potential, that kicks the resonator, charge tunnels off, that kicks the resonator again. And this is happening uh, with some irregularity. I and mean, there's correlations between these events but there's, it's not perfectly regular. Okay, and so what you can show is near this transport resonance that I was just talking about, you can actually get to a limit where the noise product, the product of the imprecision and the back action noise, get down very close to the quantum limit. This has been calculated by Ash Clerk and one of his postdocs. You get to 1.5 h-bar in principle at one of these resonant transport processes. So when I uh, one of the projects I worked on in grad school, we tried to demonstrate this, use the SET as a displacement detector and, and look at its noise properties. And we, we found we got to about an order of magnitude from, from that limit. We got to 15 h bar for the noise product for the experimentally demonstrated transistor. Um, in, you know, in this, in this uh, experiment, we're actually limited by a number of technical issues, including not being able to work at, at the optimum bias point where we have these trans, uh, transport resonances occurring. There's also some other things I won't get into. But an important point is, is that several years ago, another group at Dartmouth, uh, Alex Rubberg's group, they improved upon our work and they, got, they eliminated a lot of these technical problems that we had, and they were able to get uh, a noise product that was much closer to what was predicted uh, theoretically. And I think that they could even go do better than this, uh, better than 3.6 H bar. But they were limited in, in uh, their measurements and their ability to, to tune that coupling between the, the uh, system they were measuring and, and the detector. So they couldn't precisely balance the, the shock noise and back action noise. And I should say, in their, these measurements here, they weren't measuring a mechanical device, they were actually just measuring an LC circuit that was connected to the capacitor. Okay. Let me um, give one more example. So that, this is one example. This is, a, you know, the single electron transistor should be able to get close to the quantum limit for continuous uh, linear displacement detection. So it's a possible tool that we have for quantum measurement of mechanical devices. Um, another possibility which people are very interested in are, are cavities, uh, op both optical and microwave cavities with mechanical systems integrated in them, which I've been talking about uh, a lot in today's lecture. Um, these cavities can be used as linear displacement detectors detectors as I alluded to before. And one way that you can do that, so we have a schematic here, optical cavity, we have some mechanical membrane here. If you drive your cavity with laser light at the op optical resonance, or if it's a microwave cavity at the microwave resonance, and you're, for small displacement of the mechanical device, you'll get uh, linear modulation of the phase. Okay? 
Okay? You could also move off resonance and then have linear modulation of the amplitude. But what's important is that the noise properties in this for this linear displacement detector will be set uh, basically by the, the noise of the, the photons inside the cavity. Okay? So your imprecision noise will be dominated by shock noise of the cavity photons. Okay? So the, the relative uncertainty there will go down uh, with the number of photons. Alternatively, your back action noise for this displacement detector will, be made, will also be made up of fluctuations in photon number, but it will be through the radiation pressure force. Right? So as the photon number fluctuates, the force, the back action force on the mechanical device is going to fluctuate and kick it around and give rise to real uncertainty in its position. Okay? But you can show, and again, you can look at Marcus Aspelmeyer's review here to see this. You can show that the noise product of these two terms, the imprecision and the back action, for this system uh, should reach the quantum limit. It should reach it exactly in the ideal case. All right? So these cavity mechanical devices should provide the field with quantum limited linear displacement detector. To date, though, the um, best that's been done using phase preserving detection, so again, detection where you're measuring or amplifying both quadratures equally, detecting both quadratures equally, the best noise product that's been demonstrated is something like 100 h bar. And they're li really limited uh, by technical issues, uh, which is essentially dominated by being able to increase the coupling strength, lambda, between the, the motion of the device and the, 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 the field. Okay? Uh, I think what they're, at this point, they're not, they don't have large enough lambda to get to the point where the back action and the imprecision balance each other and you're at this optimum near you know, the quantum limit. I'll close now by just giving an example. Um, this is with a microwave cavity uh, with a me mechanical drum head resonator and it's from the group of, of Keith Schwab. Um, they've actually gotten very close uh, to having a noise product at the, the quantum limit, 5 h bar. And in this case, it's, it's similar to the case of the optical cavity. Here you have the, a drum head resonator changing the capacitance of the LC circuit. And so um, uh, it's modifying the LC circuit resonant frequency and so it can give you know, linear phase uh, modulation as well. So you're, they're using it as a linear displacement detector. But the point is here is they're actually not doing phase sensitive or phase preserving detection. They're actually doing uh, a type of detection they engineer a particular type of detection where they're only sensitive to one quadrature of motion. So they're only measuring one quadrature of the harmonic oscillator's motion. They're giving up all the information about the other quadrature. And it's important to note that in this measurement they arrange things so that these two quadratures of motion are not dynamically linked with each other. So they're measuring one and giving up all information about the other so this other quadrature becomes completely uncertain. That uncertainty doesn't feed back in time to perturb the quadrature that they're measuring. The quadratures are completely unlinked. And in doing this, they're actually able to avoid the back action noise that I've been talking about to a large degree, and that's enabled them to get close to this, this quantum limit. Okay? So they're actually, uh, in a sense, you can, you can read this paper here, it's really nice. They're observing and reducing the back action noise of the microwave cavity, the microwave photons, in the mechanical uh, motion, on the mechanical motion. Okay, so uh, that's, that's the end of the story for today. Um, but I want to say that you know, this result, along with the, the results with the single electron transistor approaching quantum limit of di displacement detection, provides new tools uh, for studying mechanical motion with sensitivity close to the quantum limit. Uh, and it, you know, there's applications for this and for engineering non-classical states of mechanical systems, as well as for implementing these in uh, you know, force sensing uh, or imaging techniques, okay, for really pushing those techniques to their ultimate limits. Okay, so today, uh, just to conclude, we've discussed some of the basic experimental challenges that face us in uh, developing mechanical quantum systems. I've you know, limited the, this discussion to you know, how the field has uh, developed techniques for reducing thermal noise and how we're beginning to develop quantum limited detectors that allow us to perform displacement detection approaching the zero point limit. Um, and the point to take home I'll leave right here is that you know, we have a small set of tools uh, that we've developed to this point so far, but the field is rapidly evolving 
and using these tools um, to do things like some of the experiments that I showed, including engineering entanglement with the microwave uh, field, and also demonstrating um, the manifestation of zero point fluctuations in the motion of a mechanical device. And next time, what I'll talk about in lecture three is another tool that we're developing that hopefully will be able to you know, take us even further uh, in these experiments uh, for manipulating and measuring quantum properties of mechanical devices. So I thank you for your time. <clears throat> so, are there questions? Uh, has anybody ever evaluated the ground state fidelity in uh, when you pull down one of the mechanical models? Uh, evaluated what? The ground state? Ground state fidelity. Fidelity? Yeah. Uh, no. You mean sort of looked at like how close what the proportion of number states are, like n equals 0, n2, basically, n2. Basically, how close, how statistically close it, is, it actually is to the ground state? Yeah, I mean, so actually looking at the number state components of what the representative populations are, right? That's one option, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, that hasn't been done. That's actually something we'd like to do with the system that I'll talk about next time, where you could actually see what these st number state statistics are, but no, that, that hasn't been done yet. Okay, the, uh, another thing I'd like to know is that, uh, so there are many mechanisms to cool down, uh -huh. uh, and what has been the most efficient one so far? The most efficient, I, I would say the, I put my money on the, Sideband cooling is what people will continue to use from now on, just because they can use it to cool. I mean, the examples I showed you, one was a 10 megahertz device, and the other one was a 3 gigahertz device. But, I mean, it could be applied in principle to even lower frequency mechanical devices, so you could you maybe work with larger mechanical structures that are even more massive and more macroscopic, uh, and cool those down. Uh, whereas, with you using cryogenic passive cooling, there's no way you can do that. Questions? Yes. Um, so one basic uh, one information protocol is teleportation. So and uh, uh, to achieve teleportation, you have to do a bell measurement. In the, and and uh, so I wonder if it would be possible to make some kind of scheme to make a bell measurement on this uh, quantum on the mechanical oscillator and the optical oscillator. Do you think it is uh, is there a scheme for that? I think I I would imagine that. Particularly in the optomechanics community, I would think that people have thought about this. I, I don't know off the top of my head of a, a proposal for doing it. Um, yeah, but I mean, certainly, I mean, with these, these two, two different sideband techniques that you can use, I, I think you would, that would give you the tools to engineer such a uh, protocol, do you think? Or, yeah, I, my, my short answer is I, I don't know of any specific protocols for doing it, but um, I can, there might be some out there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, so I have one question. You mentioned this uh, demonstration of an angle between the light and the cavity and the oscillator. Yeah. Do you know about any work where they try to couple the two mechanical oscillators? Uh, so transfer the element to the to two of them. To two of them? No, not, uh, not yet. No, I, I don't know. So you'd be using the cavity to mediate maybe interactions between the, the resonators. Uh, that I don't know. But I mean, I, certainly when people are thinking about it, and we've thought about it in the context of the system I'll talk about next time with um, a, a superconducting qubit. You could use that to mediate interaction between mechanical devices for sure. But it's certainly experimentally. Uh, hasn't been done yet. I've, people have used, um, this is getting outside of what we talked about here, but people have used a qubit to mediate interactions between the mechanical device and, and the cavity, uh, but not in any kind of quantum regime at this point. Okay, uh, other questions? If not, let's thank uh, Matt again.